Hi guys, welcome to this video on muscle architecture. You might have heard about pennate muscles, fusiform muscles or others. Let's clear all this up. Let's take a look. So this video isn't about what muscle fibre types make up the muscle and it's not a general description of the structure of the skeletal muscle. In this lesson we're going to initially classify muscles into two groups based on their architecture. And when I say architecture, what I mean is the way the muscle fibres and the tendons are arranged in relation to each other. Let me say that again. Muscle architecture is the way the muscle fibres and the tendons are arranged in relation to each other. There are other ways of classifying muscle architecture, but for the sake of simplicity, let's stick with these two main classifications. We're going to split muscles into two categories. The first of which is muscles with parallel architecture. And secondly, muscles that are pennate sometimes called pinnate um, in architecture. So parallel and pennate. Now a parallel muscle is a muscle in which the fibers of the muscle run parallel to the force generating axis. That sounds, sounds a lot to take in, in in one go. Fibers that run parallel to the force generating axis. Now the force generating axis is the overall direction or pull of the muscle or the group of muscles. So when all the forces of all the fibers are added together, the force generating axis becomes the line of pull caused by the net effect or the added together effect of all those forces. So a parallel muscle or parallel muscle architecture is where the fibers run parallel to the direction of the overall pull of the muscle. So the diagram here in the top left hand corner is meant to represent this. Uh, the yellow line represents the muscle fibers themselves um, and the direction that they run in. And you can see that it's parallel with the black arrow, which represents the force generating axis. So the second category of muscle architecture is pennate. And pennate muscles are muscles in which the fibers were not parallel, but at an angle to the force generating axis. So essentially, because of the layout of the tendons to which the pennate muscle is attached, the force or the movement that's produced by the fibers when they contract is not actually parallel to the fibers themselves. The fibers combine together to pull in a particular direction that's dictated by the location and the attachment of the tendons of that muscle. But the fibers themselves don't run parallel to the force generating axis. Instead, the fibers run at an angle to the overall force generating axis. And that's shown in the diagram in the top right hand corner. So this difference in architecture means that these different classifications of muscles have two different primary roles. So all muscles we know produce force and all muscles create movement. But in any individual or selected muscle, there's often a payoff between those two things. What I mean is that muscles that produce most force tend to have a lesser range of movement. And muscles with a greater range of movement tend to produce less force. So parallel muscles, muscles with parallel architecture, are primarily used or focused on providing a range of motion. So these muscles tend not to produce quite as much force. On the other hand, pennate muscles are the opposite. Because of the angle of the fibers, they don't allow for quite so much range of motion but they do allow for greater force production. So quickly to recap at this point, muscles of parallel architecture run parallel to the force generating axis, and they are focused on providing a range of motion around a joint. And muscles of pennate architecture, their fibers run at an angle to the force generating axis, and their most important functional role is to produce force. Now then, let's start with parallel and then move on to pennate, we're gonna see that there are three subcategories of parallel muscles that I wanna to talk to you about. And there are three subcategories of pennate muscles we'll discuss as well. So the first type of uh, parallel architecture or the first type of muscle with parallel architecture is known as a strap muscle. And strap muscles obviously have fibers that run parallel to the contraction direction, as we've already said. Uh, and essentially are called strap muscles because they look like a strap. So the muscles when they when they are under concentric contraction can be shortened up to about 40% of their length at rest. 
That's, that's very much shorter than their resting length. So as a consequence of that, they provide significant amount of length change. And this reminds us again that parallel muscles mainly focus on providing range of motion. A really good example of this kind of muscle uh, is the longest muscle in the human body, the sartorius. Next, we've got fusiform muscles. Now, fusiform muscles are not always included in the parallel group because they're usually bulkier in the middle than at the ends and shaped a bit like a cylinder in the center, uh, the, the part that we call the muscle belly. But we're going to leave them in this category for today. So fusiform muscles usually taper at either end to meet an attachment point that's smaller in diameter than the diameter at the belly of the muscle. Um, and these muscles are sometimes described as being spindle shaped, but I guess that's only really helpful to you if you've got some experience of sewing, um, which you may or may not have. But they are sometimes known as spindle shaped muscles. So the force generating axis in a fusiform muscle runs in a straight line between its origin and its insertion points. Um, and because these attachment points tend to be relatively smaller in diameter than the overall diameter at the muscle belly, then the force produced by contraction gets transferred into a smaller area, which of course then produces a greater force than it would if the insertion point were to be wider. So a good example of a fusiform muscle is the biceps brachii. Thirdly then, uh, for parallel muscles, we've got fan-shaped muscles. Now, fan-shaped muscles are obviously called fan-shaped muscles because they look a little bit like a fan. And the fibers converge into a relatively smaller point at one end and then spread out at the other end of the muscle. Sometimes they're known as convergent muscles as well. So as a consequence of their shape, fan-shaped muscles have a weaker pull on the wider attachment side um, or the wider attachment site because and again, opposite to what we've just talked about with fusiform muscles, the force generated by contraction, it's not concentrated like it is in fusiform muscles, not on the wider side anyway, is actually spread out. So on the flip side of that, however, it enables these muscles to produce more refined contractions and versatile movements by changing which fibres within the overall muscle which fibers and which motor units are contracting and which ones are firing and that's going to influence the overall direction of pull so a good example would be the pectoralis major in the chest which has a narrow insertion at the top of the humerus but a wide origin across the sternum uh, in particular so we can recruit fibers at the top at the middle at the bottom of the pectoralis major depending on what kind of movement uh, that we're performing. So that brings us to our second classification of muscle architecture and that's pennate muscles. So just to remind you, pennate muscles are muscles in which the fibres were not parallel but at an angle to the force generating axis and this angle is known as the pennation angle. So in pennate muscles the fibres tend to be shorter than in parallel muscles uh, which means a pennate muscle often has more fibres in a cross section than a parallel muscle and this these two things really hint at what we said earlier about the specialized role of the different types of muscle architecture pennation prioritizes force generation or force production uh, more than it does range of motion and there's three types of pennate muscle the name of each one tells us a little bit about the fiber relation the fibers relationship to the tendon and therefore its relationship to the force generating axis. So the first type of pennate muscle is unipennate. And the fibers of unipennate muscles are all oriented um, at the same angle and are all on one side of the tendon, hence the name uni, meaning one, unipennate. And the pennation angle is usually somewhere between obviously zero to about 30 degrees. Um, and a good example of a unipennate muscle would be the fibularis. Uh, secondly, then we've got bipennate, bi meaning two. So bipennate muscles are muscles that have fibers on two sides of a tendon. And the rectus femoris of the quadriceps is a really good example here. Um, lots of force production. Finally, then we've got multipennate. Um, multipennate architecture. This is where the muscle will have fibers orientated at more than two different angles along the line of overall pull. 
uh, which we're referring to, of course, as the force generating axis. And perhaps the best example of this kind of muscle architecture is uh, it's going to be the deltoid in the shoulder, which has anterior, medial and posterior elements. So that's it for this video. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe. It really does help me out a lot if you can do that. Um, also, it's really great hearing from you. So feel free to leave a comment or ask a question um, in the comments section. I'll get back to you. But that's all for now. So enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Take care.